Hello and welcome to series two of All The Small Things with me, Venetia. I am so excited to be bringing you a brand new season of this podcast and I'm thrilled to be kick-starting with the absolute goddess that is Candice Brathwaite. Candice Brathwaite is an author, journalist, TV presenter and the founder of Make Motherhood Diverse, an online initiative that aims to ensure more people see themselves reflected online. Candice's fantastic new book, Sister Sister is a compilation of essays about all the things she wishes she'd been told when she was a young black girl growing up in London. From family and money to black hair and fashion, as well as relationships between people of different races and colorism, it is an absolutely exceptional read and easily one of my top book recommendations for this summer. Sister Sister is the follow up to Candice's debut book, I Am Not Your Baby Mother, which was published in May 2020 and quickly became a Sunday Times bestseller. It's an urgent and eye-opening book about Black British motherhood, the first of its kind in the UK. Candice is a self-confessed beauty and fashion obsessive and she now has a regular style segment on Lorraine on ITV where she's become known for gently encouraging people to be bolder about embracing colour in their wardrobes. Coming up in this interview, Candice explains why black British women will always be at the forefront of her storytelling. She tells us about the boundaries she has in place to ensure optimum self-protection and fearless creative output, the highs and lows of social media and how she doesn't promote the idea of becoming an influencer. We also discuss friendship and trauma bonding, performative activism, cultural appropriation in wellness, colorism, her career aspirations, and much more. I am low-key obsessed with Candice. In fact, maybe it's not so low-key. And I'm just so thrilled to have her kickstarting this season. And I really hope you love this episode. let us start as we always do. I would love to hear if you have some kind of morning routine or any kind of habits and rituals that you like to do when you wake up first thing. It's quite a new one, but I I don't look at my phone. I don't engage in any social media. I don't check emails. I absolutely do not look at my phone. And it's usually um, wake up, stare at the ceiling and just do some really quick gratitude thoughts like not in a journal just in my mind let the dog out start to get the kids ready and then get yeah get them off to school so it's like that every single day I definitely am really keen to talk to you more about social media boundaries and boundaries with tech later in this conversation because I feel like it's something that you are really really good at and that (laughs) confirms my assumption but I'd also like to hear if you have if you're like a caffeine person are you a breakfast person (gasps) major caffeine way too much caffeine I swear by my Nespresso machine I've now switched from flat whites to a lingo because I was like these flat whites ain't hitting this milk. No, let's take that out. A lungo is just like a longer espresso. Love that with one sugar in the morning. Recently, actually, and lots of people, I, and lots of people would look at me and be like, I can't believe you would do that. And I'm like, I am human. But I used to have one cigarette a day, just one with my morning coffee. And many people who smoked more would be like, how is that even possible? I'm like, I don't know. But to I be just, so disciplined with it. Yeah, it, it's just the one. I I don't need any more than that. Um, but my my partner stopped smoking. And I don't like buying them. So, <laughs> <laughs> so like, I think it's been two months now. No morning cigarette. That's swiftly gone. And, and it, that's something I'm willing to give up because he was quite a heavy smoker, like 10 to 15 a day. So if, if I have to lose the one so that I'm not encouraging him absolutely fine with that um but yeah that used to be a massive part of my routine actually go your husband that's awesome I know let's wind back the clocks a little bit I'd love to hear about where you grew up and kind of some of your memories of childhood and that kind of thing I grew up in Brixton South London and my memories from childhood are quite fragmented because my mum and dad split up before I was born and I was raised primarily by my granddad, my maternal granddad. My mum went back to work quite early after having me and my granddad was left blind in one eye after a severe mugging, which means that he was written off work and he was like, I'm at home anyway, I'll raise her. And I lived with my granddad from a baby up until age eight or nine. 
and then my mum got married and I, I moved in with her and her husband. Um, but yeah, it was Brixton, South London's late 80s, early 90s. You couldn't walk five feet without seeing a reflection of yourself. Um, really tight knit community. Not that I was allowed to hang out on the street, but if anyone saw me doing anything deemed as naughty, my grandparents would know before I even got home because that's how tight it, like so in your business, Jesus. Um, and it's a Brixton that I doubt will, a, a version of Brixton I doubt will ever see again. Um, and it was fun. There were really hard parts of my childhood, of course. There was a lot of, um, a lot of noise and a lot of chaos because it was about around eight that my grandparents divorced after I think 37 years of marriage. So there was that. And then there was moving in with my mum and her husband and my mum having a new kid. And then that marriage breaking down and me seeing my dad on the weekends and he's remarried to a woman I don't quite like, you know, just all over the place. It's really crazy. I think it's only now and I'm 33. I said to my therapist the other day, I was like, oh, I finally have roots now. I live in the same place because after my mum divorced her husband, we lost our family home and we were then beholden to the council system and we moved seven times in five years. That so is in a some lot. cases, yeah, that's two houses per year. And in lots of cases that was me having to move school or like travel two hours to school. And so now in in my motherhood and in my adulthood I'm really like, wow, we have the same address. Like my kids only know one address. That's it's weird, but that's like an accomplishment for me. Mm. I'm I'm completely in awe of how you basically dedicate your life to giving your family the best grounding that they can possibly have. Mm. It's so evident in all of your writing and when I hear you talk about manifesting and setting goals and setting targets like you're creating just such an incredible life for you and your family and I think it's really really inspiring oh thank you thank you I don't I don't think about it as often as I should because then I might freak myself out yeah because I realize how in like my family lineage I'm the first I'm the first to bat in a lot of situations like I was my mum's first kid and I'm the first woman on both sides, so maternal and paternal, to do what the hell I want to do for a living. That's really insane. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not beholden to a boss. I'm not doing a nine to five that I hate. I don't feel sad and heavy waking up in the morning. And that's a massive privilege, right? Like that is just the luck of the draw. That is just timing. Because if I was my mum or my nan on either side, like maternal or paternal, my life would be so different. It's just time. But not only are you the first person of your family, you're also like the first person or the first black woman to be doing a lot of the things that you're doing. Like <laughs> you wrote, I, I could not believe this, but you wrote the first book on black motherhood in the UK. So not only are these things happening, like not to like stress you out even more, <laughs> but the scale is kind of massive. And I am really, really interested to hear about how you actually started in publishing before moving into kind of blogging and, and writing and sharing, sharing things online and that kind of thing and then eventually to doing what you're doing now which is more like presenting entrepreneurship Mm. all of these incredible things but take me back to your time in publishing and what happened then to make you go okay maybe maybe I should be doing something else I I I won a job in publishing I won it they um Penguin Random House had introduced something called the scheme where they wanted to make the workforce more diverse and it was the first competition of its kind where you did not need a degree to get into publishing and I didn't go to uni I think I barely got A levels and so I was like my daughter was two I was really depressed and I was like of course, that's a dream job. I applied and I think out of 2000 applicants, I was one of four to win one of the year long placements. And what I found was that blogging was becoming their primary resource and way to advertise their new titles. So I'd be given like a spreadsheet and I'd phone 100 bloggers a day and be like, how much do you charge to feature this book? How much do you 
And then when they told me how much they charge, I was like, kid, you're in the wrong job. What they were saying, like that, you know, one post, that's what I'm making a week, two weeks, you know. What I also noticed is that, say, I'd call 100 bloggers a day, none of them were black. None. There Mm -hmm. was not even a diverse pool of bloggers. And so... And it's funny, I was in, I, I ended up in the marketing department. It was, it was a marketing scheme. Um, and I was just like, right, the gap in the market is there is no diversity. Um, and also I've seen how much these people can make. How can I get on the other side? And it just gnawed away at me. And I started my placement in um, Ebri, who feed, they work on like cookbook titles and and um like celebrity autobiographies and then I got transferred to children's and before the transfer everyone was like oh you're gonna love it there you've got a kid it's gonna be wicked hated it hated every single day oh no I was like I cannot talk about Peter Rabbit or Peppa Pig or or whatever the hell it like I I just felt my brain fizzling and one day I just quit I just phoned my husband, Papa B, and I was like, I quit. And I'm not going to lie, that caused deep tension in our home because we were really brassic then. And me saying that I'm going to step away from a job that's helping us keep our head above water, he was not happy about it. But I was like, listen, I know I sound crazy, but I have a plan. I've noticed this pattern. I've seen a gap in the market. Everyone just thought I was nuts. But I knew that I could create and build a community around the idea of motherhood and parenting from a black perspective. And I knew I could do that because I had been searching for it for years and couldn't find it. Mm. And I was like, you know, they say build it and they will come. I was like, girl. And I, 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 I did build. I built for four years before I saw a paid job. Four years. So were you working on the side at the same time as doing that? No. I was just at home. Wow looking after my kid, surviving on Papa B's wage. That's so interesting because a lot of, when I when I hear people give advice about what kind of aspiring bloggers, YouTubers, influencers, for what a, want of a better word, who want to break into that industry, people, are, people usually the advice people give is, don't quit your day job. <laughs> no, right? <laughs> and you just did the opposite of that. Like, that is my top line now. I'm like, don't quit your day job if you can manage both. But I'm a Pisces, so I'm like of two extremes. I'm like totally disconnected or I'm all in. Also, it didn't help that my daughter's childcare was really up and down. I found it really hard to be the mum I envisioned I would be and be doing this nine to five where I'm literally running to Victoria Station each day because I know if I miss the 10 past five, then I'm going to be, you know, all of that panic. And so there was a beauty to just being able to um, raise her the way I wanted to, but it was such a struggle. So I would say to anyone, if you want to, do you know what? Rewind. I don't even promote the idea of becoming an influencer. It's just, it's just not something I'm into. I'm like, I know people now use that term towards me, but I'm like, um, I always tell people I work in advertising I sell space on my online platforms. Vogue magazine does it. Grazie do it. Like I work in advertising. If you want to become an influencer because you think I'm going to get free stuff and be really popular, your career is over before it's even began. Also, that is such a short, that's such a short sighted viewpoint of what you're trying to do. Now that I'm here, I think it's becoming clear to everyone, even the blogging or the influencing was purely a stepping stone. Yeah. So then <laughs> it's like, okay, thanks, call mama. Yep, three years tops. Okay, out, bye. Like, it's not, I do not, being a full-time, long-term influencer is not sustainable. Totally. And you really do strike me as someone who has like a real plan. And I've heard you talk <laughs> about this. You're like, I'm going to be here for a little bit. I'm going to graft. I'm going to like cash in while I can. And then I'm out. Off. Just <laughs> like totally off. And now I'm trying to like um, manifest and find ways to make the money I do online without having to be so present. And that's not easy, but it is the goal. 
you right, know? right, right, right. Um, let's talk a little bit about your books because uh, I know that neither of your books um, were written for me. I'm a white person. I'm a white woman. They're not. They weren't written with me in mind. I have gained so much from both of them and I feel incredibly privileged to have read them you are such a good writer let's go back to your first book I'm not your baby mother it's about black British motherhood it was released last summer and became a Sunday Times bestseller in a recent incredible interview for Pass the Mic with Julie Adenuga you say at this point this book isn't even about me. Can you explain more about that and also the journey of the book since its release last year? I Am Not Your Baby Mother must have been the most begrudging task I've ever undertaken in my entire career. I didn't want to write a book about motherhood. I had like 10 previous ideas that were all turned down and the pushbacks were your platform's not big enough. We don't really think, you know, speaking directly to another black woman is the best thing for the market. It was always an amalgamation of that kind of no. And so by the time I got to I'm Not Your Baby Mother, I was exhausted. And before Quirkus picked it up, it was two weeks away from being self-published because I just lost my rag. I was like, I'm tired, you know? And then people kept saying, write a book about motherhood. And I was like, have you been to the library? There are 50 million titles about that. I cannot possibly bring something new to the market. And then ding, I was like, oh, yeah, you can. When you, when I was pregnant with my firstborn, all of the material about black motherhood, I had to source from the US because the UK did not have any titles written by black women about their experience of motherhood, which people who have read I'm Not Your Baby Mother can see it's very, very different to the white experience of motherhood. So I thought, okay, we're here again. Motherhood, open market, let's do this. Wrote it, despised the writing process, was really hard on myself. Was like, I don't ever want to talk about this book ever again. <laughs> like a week before it was published, I was like, no one's even going to buy it. Stop bothering me. <laughs> and then... <laughs> <laughs> Quite the opposite happened. And then... In anyone I speak to, I always say to them, I cannot give credit to that book without highlighting the sad fact that the push of I'm Not Your Baby Mother was um, encouraged by the murder of George Floyd. That's an absolute fact. I'm Not Your Baby Mother came out one week before his murder went viral. And so that meant that that book was pulled into these huge mature li reading lists of education with the why I'm no longer talking to white people about race with... Um, natives by Akala and when I kept seeing my book pop up into that I was like you know this book is a child a mere baby and you guys are like like acting like she's been to uni and she's graduated I was like give me my kid back she's been out two weeks you cannot do this to her like I was, <laughs> I was so furious and then I had this moment where I was like okay Candice this book actually was not about you could you just get your ego out of the way for a minute and understand that you were perhaps a vessel for a story that needed to be told. And again, timing. And I guess that must have been a way to alleviate, correct me if I'm wrong, but it must have felt like a little bit jarring to have a book be way more successful than you anticipated as a result of some really unfortunate events, yeah. right? Yeah. And so I guess you kind of removing your ego from it a little bit is probably a way to help you kind of cope with that. Because yeah. that's a lot. Totally, totally removing my ego. And it just reminded me, like, um, just take the rough with the smooth. Like, any author listening or author to be, I never have. Like, I've never read any reviews on Amazon. I've never checked that book's rating. I've never been obsessed with what people are saying about it because it just merely exists. And I just see it as this entity, like humans, that will be judged regardless. And if I try to manipulate and control what everyone thinks and says and picks apart, not only will I lose my mind, I will not create more work. And again, I'm very Piscean that once a body of work is complete, that's it for me. I'm not then like, oh, I'm like, oh, no, we're done. What's next? I'm not a look back kind of gal at all. And you have to be like that in any creative field. If not, it will stunt your growth. And I don't want to allow myself to be a victim of other people's opinions so that it, 
transforms the way I communicate. That would be really, really sad. And the only way for that not to happen is to not read it at all. I don't care who you are, how thick you think your skin is, those things embed themselves into your psyche and change the way you view yourself and your work. And you have to trust that the voice you've been given and the gift you've been given in the way you communicate is just what it is. That is so inspiring. I'm going to listen to you say that. I'm going to like (laughs) chop that up and listen to you say that every single day. Not even joking. (laughs) Um, So let us talk about your new book, Sister, Sister. Please, can you tell listeners what they can expect from this collection of essays and perhaps why you originally planned to release this before I Am Not Your Baby Mother? I originally planned to release this before I'm Not Your Baby Mother because in terms of like, so in my mind, before I even had a book deal, I always had this idea of bringing out a trilogy and luckily Quirkus have have played into my little plan. And so we're going to bring out a book year on year up until next year. So I'm writing my third book right now. The because manuscript- you don't stop. <laughs> I'm just like, huh. the manuscript is due in at Christmas. But anyway, Sister Sister, in my opinion, should have become come before I'm Not Your Baby Mother because Sister Sister is essentially like a manual, a toolkit, a guide for like my preteen, early 20 years, for how I saw myself before I became a parent. And so I would always say, like, who, whoever's reading these books, I would say, sis, read Sister, Sister first, then I'm Not Your Baby Mother, and then the book that does have a title, but I don't think I'm allowed to say, next, like, read them in that order. And Sister, Sister is exactly that. I remember growing up and, like, those manuals on, like, how to be a great independent girl. They were all the rage back then. But it was like, yeah, pull your hair into this high ponytail and then put some rouge on your cheeks. And I was like, "Mm, yeah, I don't think those steps are for me. And so Sister Sister is that version of book, but with a black British woman as the main character. And that for me is going to be a theme for as long as people say that I'm an author a black British female is always going to be at the heart of these stories why I've got a lot of I don't have enough time to make up for the amount of books I read where I wasn't the main character and how I just had to imagine myself in these situations or believe that the author was talking to me and there has been a great cry for white people to educate themselves. And and I don't always think that education needs to be a literal step-by-step about how to be anti-racist. It's as simple as reading books where it's clear you're not the main character, you're not the main target, like reading around that, embedding yourself in a psyche that isn't necessarily about or for you. I think that's really powerful, just as powerful as being like, Here's your 30 day book on how not to be racist. I was actually really struck by how brilliantly you write about friendship. Friendship is a big part of everyone's sense of community, sense of self. It's just, it's huge. And I think, you know, we all go through different phases with friendship. I've, I heard something like, most friendships only last they have like a lifespan of seven years don't know if you agree with this but in the book you remind the reader to ask ourselves some really simple questions do I actually like this person do they make make me feel like we're in competition with each other do I actively want to spend time with them simple questions but really (laughs) really really helpful so what does a good mutually loving friendship look and feel like for you It just doesn't have any pressures. And I think I also said in the friendship chapter, like, as women specifically, we are always taught to put so much emphasis on our romantic relationships. And you should know what you want your other half to look like and do and earn. And we just, we're never encouraged to do that with friendships. And I'm like, you're actually outside of your romantic relationships, some days even more, you're going to spend more time with your friends, you are going to lean on your friends more than any romantic partner. And the fact that we don't have those boundaries, or that checklist in place is really problematic. Because it does mean and I'm speaking from experience that there's a lot of trauma bonding that held my friendships together. like oh my god you know um that guy dumped you too let's be friends yeah oh my god you don't live at home and you have a really strained relationship with your parents let's be friends like terrible 
terrible because if the if the only reason this friendship is being developed is because you're you both have suffered the same hard stuff my granddad always has this saying one or cannot row a boat mm. and those kind of friendships are one or friendships like you're just here with your one trauma or like let's see how far we can go not very far because you need a friend who is gonna help you overcome those traumas be able to listen understand perhaps why you disconnect and don't answer the phone and they don't like hold that against you and that takes time to find you know and it's taken me time to develop those relationships a bit like a romantic relationship and be honest with my friends about where I am but also reciprocity which is something I struggled with for years I was very like well what can you do for me and why don't you answer my call and now, like, approaching my mid-30s, I'm like, do you need me to collect your kid from school? Do you need me to cook dinner? I know, like, you're not a hugger. What can I do for you in this moment? I also think many of our friendships, they're a bit lopsided because we forget that we need to be um, giving as much as we're taking. How do you feel about lifespans of friendships? And how hard do you personally fight for a friendship if you feel like it's flagging I do not fight for flagging friendships whatsoever I think the flagging is su- is just your intuition making noise like mm. and, and because when I have fought for flagging friendships it's cost me a lot in terms of my confidence or because that you know things just get prickly and like I said someone feels like they're in competition with you or they wait till you're around um, other friends to like put you down and I, I allow people to do that for me for, year, to, for years because I was like, no, my childhood trauma is like got to be a people pleaser, just got to keep you happy. So now that flagging, I'm like, woo, woo, it's time to go. Absolutely cool with that. And I am such a believer in, I, I think it's something to do with the planet in that seven year cycle absolute believer in that I've had so I've got a really great friend now who I met when I was 14 we stopped talking when I was about 21 22 and uh, she came back into my life like two years ago wow so I'm a very yeah I'm a I'm a great believer in cycles I'm a great believer in um friendships for a season and there are perhaps there'll perhaps be one if not two friends that I've had my entire life. But even those friendships, when I look back, there are there are months, if not years, where we, we haven't communicated as we did in the beginning, but I still consider those people my friends. Let's talk about social media because I always love hearing <laughs> you talk about it. I love hearing you talk about the boundaries you set with it and also the expectations we should let go of around it. In the essay, tweet, like, share, delete and repeat, you say, I have to remind myself daily that having a presence on social media is very different to always being present on social media. When talking about having a big platform as well, I've heard you say, it's not all that. Please, can you tell me <laughs> some of the highs and lows that have come with your time online? The highs are that um, a bit like a magazine, the bigger the platform, the greater the readership. Hopefully, the more positive aspects of that platform can reach a lot of people. I'm also not going to lie. I do think having a platform of sorts, um, it, 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 puts a little glint in a publisher's eye or a TV producer's eye. It just does. So I'm not even going to lie about that. So those things, purely from a marketing, advertising side of things, great to have a big platform. Everything else is absolutely trash because (laughs) we just rubbish, just very rubbish, (laughs) just very rubbish. (laughs) It is not human to take on the opinions and judgments of 200,000 people every single day. That is not how we will ever be wired. To put a thought out there and then sit there and watch comments come through that will disagree with you, that will call you names, that may be racist or homophobic because they're not in agreement with the opinion you've dared to share, that is not healthy. And I'm saying this from a place of someone who was that person who would be on my phone 24 seven, wake up to use the toilet, what new DMs, what new comments, like, how can I boost my engagement? Um, Do enough people like me? 
And I just fell out of love with that. It's just a complete hamster wheel to the point now that I even post against the algorithm. I'll post something at 1 p.m. And it will get three likes. And I'll be like, yes, look at me, rebel of the year. I don't give a damn. Like, Because <laughs> I'm just like, this is really silly. It seemingly becomes such a necessity. And I think anyone who has a social media space they want to grow, you have to travel through that tunnel of understanding that this is not real. It's extremely damaging to your mental health. And um, you don't owe anyone anything. There is a blanket of entitlement running rampant on social media right now. I myself, the past couple of weeks, with one of the biggest news stories, have woken up to DMs and horrific abusive dms about why are you not speaking about this thing you know use your privilege and i'm just like it's that it's the fact that perhaps because you've positioned me as a black activist in your mind you now believe that myself and this platform are are at your service and it was never that it's never that there's still a human being behind what is now seemingly a business infrastructure and so the things i do like i said i don't check it in the morning I have a PA who goes through my DMs and all of that took time, right? Because it felt really egotistical. It was like a PA, who do you think you are? Like small me was very like, girl, get a grip. No one cares. It's like, no, well, someone does. And so my PA may come across a DM calling me the N word before I do. That's a necessity. In my opinion, that boundary is an absolute necessity. I hear people platforms of 20K saying, oh, I'm responding to every DM. I I laugh and I think, good luck with that. It's so bad. We cannot be um, everything to everyone. And you just have to hope that those invested in these platforms understand that you're human too. I've experienced some of, uh, well, one of the things that you've raised, which is like, you know, being pressured to talk about something Mm. that you don't necessarily know all that much about. Yes. You don't want to be a part of spreading misinformation. You don't want to like, actually also for me, it's like, I don't want to, there's certain things I've been asked to speak about where I'm like, I shouldn't actually be taking up any space here. And I think it's as much about what are we doing as users to make sure that we're not actually backing people into corners to speak about stuff that they're actually not well versed in exactly absolutely not well versed in deeply uncomfortable speaking about because I'm not that educated and I I don't get to remind people often but when Black Lives Matter was at its loudest last year I was not that social media activist that ever called out white people for not posting a black square or seemingly not reposting a reading list I don't have time for that also with what I've had to do the past couple weeks like if I had posted anything that to me is performative absolutely performative because I would have posted that felt like oh you kind of got away with that and then not thought about the situation again and what worries me it's like okay is that how I want to say how far we've come but is that how much we've regressed as a society I could repost something some reading guides or an image and a hashtag and would you guys just take that as my sincere word for supporting or not supporting or wanting to educate. That is horrific. Being in a position to be okay with not being pressured to talk about things takes self-esteem. There we go. And it's it's like my favourite quote, right? Silence cannot be misquoted. All you could ever say is that Candice never said anything. And in certain situations, I'd rather that be the line you run with. I will not respond to DMs, to any antagonising of being called out. Also, though, I've learned that the hard way. I've been put through the ringer on social media. Like, right. I've got my stars and stripes. Like, I'm like, I, I know this playground like the back of my hand. And the only thing I know that is my best defense is not giving someone a quotable. Like, she said nothing. Even if that annoys you or you want to then go and spread um, rumors that, you know, I am, I'm selfish or I'm unkind. That's great. There are forums where you can get that off your chest too. I'm used to that. But it's like, I now have a responsibility to this platform to not hop on every single wave or news source because babe 
my Instagram is not CNN. And that's what I need people to remember. Like, I'm not just going to be this constant reporting stream of, oh, this is happening there. And this is because also my ancestry and my lineage means that trauma is a heavy part of what I'm trying to work through. So maybe, yes, this is my privilege speaking, maybe primarily, this is a safe space of joy for black people. Just, just maybe, you know, There's an amazing chapter in the book titled The Woo Woo on Manifestation. What I found really interesting about it um, and something I've been thinking about a lot is how people, but predominantly white people, have co-opted and commodified Mm. ancient traditions, indigenous traditions. I'm literally sat drinking a matcha latte (laughs) right now, which just feels so apt uh, for this part of our conversation. I know that you love some of these things. I love some of these things. My listeners love some of these things. Things like uh, yoga, um, burning of sage, crystal work, like this kind of thing. Um, but what you're saying in the chapter is we don't need to give these things up, do we? No, we no. We do not need to give them up at all. We just need to commit to doing the research of where these things originated from and be respectful of those boundaries or of the way we should be doing these practices. Like one time before I understood the history of say sage or saging, I bought my sage from a white lady selling it on Etsy. Wrong across, just just completely wrong across the board. Maybe don't buy your sage off the internet. Maybe don't buy it off of someone who doesn't know the indigenous roots of sage cleansing. Like really try and buy the physical elements of these practices from the people who can give you the best education about why they're used and where they're from. Like, I just think it's far too easy to be like, yeah, I've got my crystals and my sage. Because also, and I was having this conversation the other day, yes, we are all in now on manifestation and thinking thinking positively, but for every yin, there's a yang. So there is also darkness. There is also heaviness. There could perhaps be also ways you are leaving yourself open to negative energy if you are not doing these practices correctly. Like I spend a lot of time scrolling on TikTok, which means I get sent to witch talk a lot. It's very confusing. And then there are like- What is witch talk? So like, it's where like, Um, witches I'm doing air quotations guys of all ages who like use crystals and herbs and medicines and like pray at certain times when Saturn's covering Mars or some shit like that um (laughs) all of those people are like in a little argument like all you baby witches you're doing this wrong and you're going to leave yourself open to negativity and then like surely enough two scrolls down there's an 18 year old crying her eyes out because she's bought a very expensive powerful piece of crystal into her home and now doesn't understand why her life is falling apart oh wow because because she didn't ask you didn't understand the the energy around this certain crystal and I'm just like oh my gosh even I have so much to learn because the woo-woo is based in a in a in a resource of energy you can't shut it off. That's not me saying, oh, you don't get to manifest and you don't get to. As long as you have a body, you are in the web of manifestation. That is a fact. But it is also about allowing those who have perhaps had their practices stolen from them or not being allowed to use this certain spice or herb or crystal, paying respect and homage to those beginnings. And, you know, it's it's that for me. And, and that's why I'm like, no offense, I'm like, I'm I'm so over the goopifying of everything. It's like, can we have more documentaries really going into like the jungles in India to find out where these things are from, you know? Mm-hmm. And made by the people, like documentaries made by the pe- people right. who are already from there. And Exactly. Totally, totally, totally. Um, there is a really impactful essay about colorism where you write about how you've lost out on opportunities to light-skinned women. This must be so, so exhausting for you. Um, what's your hope for the future of not just the conversation around colorism, but also how it manifests in the media and perhaps how we think about the spaces that we take up and the spaces that we could perhaps remove ourselves from? Yeah, colorism is such a hard one because I say in that essay, 
um, if racism is like them, as in the idea of white supremacy, colorism is very much us. Colorism was was a negative tool we picked up from, say, slave times, where essentially, for those that don't know, darker skinned slaves had to work in the field and lighter skinned slaves, those who could pass as, say, like the master's third cousin or whatever, were allowed to work in the house. So even slaves were divided by their skin tone. Darker skinned slaves weren't respected, you know, that. It's just something that I find my community still do to each other a lot. And it's not just me as a dark skinned TV presenter or author who's like, I feel the sting of that. I have many friends with my complexion in this industry who we just go back and forth on some absolute horror stories or knowing when you're the right person for the job in every sense of the word but someone with a fairer complexion because they can be sold as more um, white passing and European and softer and more appealing to um, white British sensibility. That's why you're left hanging. And it's very, very painful. But I also say that as a very dark skinned black woman who is, who is on a roll, who is just on this upward trajectory of excellence And I have to also acknowledge that it's like the dark skinned girl just beginning in her office space is probably looking at me like, oh, auntie, would you shut up? Like with your husband and your house and your 15 jobs, like, but the colorism for me, like, it's just, it's never going to go away. Oprah's not a dark skinned black woman. She's just Oprah. And like everyone puts respect on her name because she's built a brand so strong. You're like, I don't care if Oprah lost an arm tomorrow, that's Oprah Winfrey. And I can see the Candice Brathwaite brand doing the same thing. I don't think that means that Oprah Winfrey doesn't get tears in her eyes when she remembers when she couldn't get a certain job because she had an afro or her skin was dark. That success doesn't dilute the pain and the damage that I know colorism still does. And all I can hope is that when the Candice Brathwaite's, the Clara Amphos, the Otega Uagbas, the whoever's of the world, of their industries who are darker skinned. All I can hope is that when we get to a certain position, we are willing to fight hard for those that look like us in terms of complexion. I'm not expecting anyone else to do it because a bit like racism, colorism serves a lot of people. It's like, well, I'm sorry that, you know, I was born this way. I didn't ask for that, but I, I just need to do my job. And it's like, it's again asking people to with hot to, to let go of some of their power and mm-hmm. some of their entitlement just based on how they were born. That's, that's, that ask is just beneath me saying, you guys make me feel bad about the way I look just how I was born. Do you know what I mean? So I get that there can be some difficulty there, but until we are willing to be honest about how colorism is still at play and what we can do to ensure that, say you're on a set and, oh, this is so diverse and inclusive. Yeah, but what's your version of black? Is it light skinned with hazel eyes and like not an Afro, but soft hair? Is that really black? Or can you not find a dark skinned black woman with an Afro who no one's going to second guess that she's a black woman, you know? Are we working hard to do that? I don't think we are. Will we get there? I I hope so. I I hope so. I am really keen to hear a little bit more about how you're carving out a career for yourself in television. I used to work in TV and Although I had a, a great time, I know how tough that industry is, especially <laughs> if you're in front of the camera. It's blimmin' competitive. There is always yeah. someone, when I say someone, <laughs> there's always 10,000 people who would love your job. So how are you finding your time on television and what aspirations do you have for the future of your TV career? Because you know what, Candice? Oprah, come, <laughs> Oprah comes up a lot, right? And I do see you hosting your own <laughs> talk show in a big big way <laughs> do you know what it's um the reason why I go into these tv spaces and not only am I not phased about competition I don't know who's my competition I'm damn good at my job I'm damn good at my job and so because I know that I don't swear anything 
because I've tried to be other things, right? Like I've tried other, like I, I'd be the worst supermodel. It's just not where my gifts are. You t run me a line and you switch on the camera and I will nail it time and time. I will do a live show and my mic's falling out and I'm still communicating with my audience. This happened only two weeks ago. Like I just know I'm good at my job and I just know, intrinsically know what I was put here to do. So as soon as that camera comes on, I think I'm more myself than anyone else. Also, I've had really good um, practice. So my test, you, you do a screen test before you get like a TV job. And my screen test for the Lorraine show was the day after someone outed me as a sex worker online. Wow. So I wake up that next day from crying all night. And I go to that studio knowing that this is now like a news thing and Lorraine really embraces me. And she's like, you know, we love you regardless. And I smack my screen test. And in that moment, I was just like, girl, you're a bad bitch. You <laughs> I was just, I left there like, aha, they really can't keep you down. Like, this is really what you're supposed to do. The screen test for that was November 2019. And I didn't start to appear on people's screens for Lorraine until like mid-2020. So that shows you like how long you're waiting, how long things are being put in position. And the only reason I say confidently that the candy show will be a thing is because not only is it because I know it's what I'm destined to do, it's what it's what this country needs. Like not since Trisha, Trisha Goddard. So not since Trisha and maybe June Sarpong doing stuff on T4, have we really been able to see reflections of ourselves on daytime TV? We have the awesome Alison Hammond now coming in. I think it's on this morning. Yeah. But it's like we are well overdue for more of that. And I think me being shoved into the TVs of Middle England at 9am whilst they're having cereal is a really good starting off point. 100%. 100%. <laughs> It's not like I've got the 8 p.m. like slot where we know like more millennials might tune in. No, it's 9 a.m. where we're either at work or asleep and it's me speaking to like middle-aged people up. And those are the people's minds who need the most massaging about what diversity and inclusion needs to look like on their TV. And I get so many messages from like white ladies who are like 70 who are like, I love you so much. And I'm like, do you know why that's cool? Because I know you, your age, I know you had a preconceived notion about what black people are or how we appear. And you loving me means that you may be less judgmental to that black boy walking down the street. Or, oh no, she reminds me of that Candice off Lorraine. Like, she's got to be lovely. <laughs> like, I can see how that is a thing. And to be part of that thinking, I'm like, how could they not? be a candy show and and basically I've designed the whole show and the concept I work with really great producers and I'm always like um guys one day you're gonna work on my show right and they laugh and they're like yeah sure and I I think it's really cute that they think it's a joke I'm like this is actually gonna happen <laughs> little do they know <laughs> like, this is being manifested every single day and it's gonna happen you, prob you probably know exactly when it's gonna happen as Literally. well <laughs> Well, I can't wait to watch it all unfurl. I really, really can't. Okay, let us start rounding up with some final questions. How do you feel about a quick fire round? Go for it. Quick fire with Candice. Breakfast, lunch or dinner? Dinner. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Pancakes or waffles? Pancakes. Mac or Fenty? Fenty. Nails or lipstick? Girl, nails. Ah! <laughs> Writing or presenting? <gasps> oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Um, oh, God. Writing. <laughs> books or Netflix? Oh, books. Books, books. Moesha or Sister Sister? Moesha. Pajamas and stay at home with a movie or heels and a night out? Pajamas every time. Daily sleeper dress or daily sleeper pajama suit? Dress. Routine or spontaneity? Spontaneity. Early night or night owl? Night owl. I say that despondently. <laughs> what is your one non-negotiable daily self-care habit? 
sunscreen I, that sounds very boring but su- like I've only just become hip to how important that is sunscreen every day do you have a favorite go-to sunscreen yes um La Roche-Posay and 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 Thelos SPF 50 great for all skin tones because black women it's that white cast you don't want to live with what have you read, listened to, or watched recently that you can't stop thinking about, loved, and would love to recommend? I think on Netflix, it's either called, I think it's called In Our Mother's Gardens, and it's an African-American documentary, speaking to people like Tarana Burke, the founder of Me Too, about their histories with their mothers and their grandmothers. That That's a conversation I have deep trauma around. And so to watch women gather and not only celebrate, but talk about their traumas in that also has given great comfort because it's important as me now being a mum to know that I can do that job well, even with those existing traumas. So yeah, it's on Netflix in our mother's gardens. Really good. Awesome. I'll leave that in the show notes. Thank you for such a great recommendation. If you could advise listeners to do or try one thing today to help them find joy, what would it be? I heard this two days ago and my therapist said it a while back, game changer, just get a notebook or a journal and the header should be, if nothing bad were going to happen, what would I do? That is like your opening line for just this very quick, simple journal exercise. If nothing bad were going to happen, what would I do? So much of our dreams and what we think is unreachable is is just smothered by fear. It's like, I couldn't possibly do that. I couldn't write that and then when you see what transpires you can get a good handle about how how on track you are with your inner self and what your duty is here on this earth and I think that's I think that's really important stunning and finally what is one thing that you hope your future self will have achieved I hope my future self will have achieved being that name that Um, cements my great great grandchildren so that I can provide a long lasting legacy across all platforms spiritual um, financial because you know we hear a lot about generational wealth but it's not just the money so I'd love to be the name in the mix of the great 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 grandkids I will never meet like oh you know why we have this villa right grandma Candice yeah she was a bad girl back in the day like that Oh my gosh, just thinking about being able to hear myself come up in conversation in that long lasting legacy way, that is like an ultimate turn on. I feel so, so honoured to have had this time with you. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. No, thank you. This was great. Thank you so much for listening to this interview. If you enjoyed it, please do make sure you're subscribed and don't be shy to send the episode to a friend and you can always share it on your Instagram stories, tagging me at Venetia Lamana and at ATST Podcast. Do be sure to check out the episode notes for links to my guests and their work and I will see you back here next week for a brand new episode. Mm-hmm.